might surprise this audience, although all of us have been speaking sort of glibly, glibly about the obviousness of human uniqueness, is that there is no real biological definition of what it is to be a human. We don't have the uh, fine definition in place that allows us to readily say, that's a human, and in the fossil record, this is not a human. What happened in the Victorian era, when we first began to examine our sort of origins, was it was very easy. The religious text told us what it was to be a human, and we were separate from the world. We were separate from the animal world. We were different in very obvious ways. We stood upright. We were more complex. We had spirituality. We had tools that no other animal seemed to come near. We had all the physical features that we're all aware of, a large brain, small teeth. We could compare ourselves, and Darwin even noticed this, to what he presumed were our closest living relatives in Africa. But clearly that difference was substantive, it was obvious, and it didn't need defining. It was already manifestly defined in our history. Then we began to find fossils. Now, very luckily, they fit our preconceived ideas in the order in which they were found and in our expectations of human uniqueness. The first ones being found in Europe were large brain, but what we would consider crude and primitive in the form of the early Neanderthals. That was followed by uh, faux fossils, which fit our preconceived ideas even better. We even invented them in Piltdown, uh, which actually led us to the obvious conclusion that all the important events in human evolution had happened where the highest states of civilization are, places like Europe. And so we had actually manufactured a fossil record that agreed with our, ourselves. Then we moved that story to Africa, 1924, the discovery of the Tong child. That was a small-brained, uh, it looked like a biped, so it seemed to separate itself out from the world. And the fossils that would follow would, as they began to gain acceptance, show the kind of just-so stories that fit the idea of human uniqueness. And as Stephen and I were talking before this discussion, maybe it's just all of those. But the problem with that is that's really moving right back to where we were in the Victorian era. We can see it, but we can't test it. We can't formulate a hypothesis to test it. But we need that hypothesis because that neat little story that I was just telling that we kind of saw through a broad timeline of a few million years as, as, we, as we delivered it is falling apart. Those sacred cows are dying, particularly in the last 15 years. As the fossil record has exploded, and quite literally, the numbers are doubling on almost a yearly basis now on the continent of Africa as we begin to expand our exploration programs, those sacred cows are dying. Just recently, with Ardipithecus ramidus, we realized that, that bipedalism may have other definitions than this sort of simplified version that we see here of elongated legs and, and the changes in structure to our pelvis and our foot, and that words like facultative bipedalism come into the record. That brain size and, and those moments of shift in brain size maybe either didn't occur at all or were not necessarily important for changes. Things like Australopithecus sediba, which my team and I described uh, a few years ago, has a small brain, but reorganization appears to be taking place. Things like the Flores hobbit, that many of you might have heard of, this small, contentious member of the genus Homo on the island of Flores, dating to maybe uh, 50, 90,000 years, or something like this, is clearly in our genus, with a tiny brain the size of a chimpanzee but capable of complex activity. So that brain size argument may actually fall away or be slaughtered along with others. We're seeing different sorts of, of manipulative abilities that are not all the same in the hands. And we can go right through the body and see each one of these things slaughtered. So all we're really left with are just a few things. In, 19, in the uh, 1950s, Jane Goodall brought us a little closer to the animal kingdom. She found out that chimpanzees use tools, struck everyone as remarkable, and so from that Victorian perspective, it perhaps brought us to here. As all of these sort of sacred cows have died, we've been brought closer and closer, till today, we are possibly only left with the differentiation between us and the animal kingdom with those things that we talk about to identify moder modernity. Art, perhaps, self-adornment, perhaps burial of the dead indicating we're special in nature. 
But I have a prediction for you, and everyone here that's probably a little more than a prediction. I wouldn't hold on to all those things either. Because what we're now seeing, as we begin to actually explore Africa, the old world, other places, is those sacred cows are probably all going to die. And it's going to be a very interesting moment for us as we seek a definition in our field of what is it to be human when there's nothing left that makes us actually unique.